Here is an author in their element, their craft, delivering some of the best combat scenes I've read lately. That never wanders far from my mind. I think that this might be one of the single best representations of dragons that I've read in the fantasy genre. This book is a dark, fascinating, disgusting, wonderful, nauseating, intriguing, effed up, heartfelt, brutal character study. That recaptures the magic of far flung galaxies, grand ideas, and more. There's so much this book gets right. Like any good map, you're aware of the destination it's leading you towards. But the way it takes you there is very pretty indeed. An all-consuming dreamscape, the lights of Poe Morpheus. It's a neo-retro futuristic fest. This is guns that go star. Uh, welcome to uh, TBRCon panel for 2023, panel number 28. Um, we have an awesome group assembled here of some fabulous authors. I can't wait to uh, delve into the topic of hard versus soft magic systems uh, with this, this great assembly of talent. Um, I'm P.L. Stewart, author and blogger. Um, special shout out to the wonderful Adrian Gibson for facilitating uh, TBRCon uh, 2023. Um, there's so many great panels. There's uh, readings uh, from authors. Um, there's D and D uh, live stuff going on. So I encourage you to check it out. It's not too late. Uh, just uh, go on YouTube and punch in uh, SSF, SFF uh, Addicts Podcast and or uh, FanFi Addict, and you'll you'll be able to access uh, all of those, the ones that have been uh, already uh, live and now recorded. So. Um, Shout out to the incredible Beth Tabler. I'm I'm simply filling in for her. She was supposed to be the moderator for this panel. She's a bit under the weather. Hope you're feeling better, Beth, if you're watching. Uh, she is the fabulous uh, leader of Before We Go Blog and also uh, one of the big editors for Grimdark Magazine. So shout out to Beth. And I hope you are feeling better. Um, so uh, without further ado, um, our esteemed guests, I'd like to give them a chance to introduce themselves. Um, I apologize. We'll go, if that's okay, we'll go my clockwise, kind of clockwise. So basically we'd start with Rebecca. So um, I'll let everyone introduce themselves. Uh, hi everyone, it's lovely to be here. Um, so I'm a half British, half French, half Iranian author. Um, he writes in English at the moment. Um, I write sort of fantasy, young adults, uh, quite a lot of soft magic system things, but I enjoy hard magic systems. So it'll be an interesting one to chat about. Uh, my latest novel has come out last year, Collarbound, and book two is coming out in May, The Hawkling. Um, and again, lots of social magic stuff to discuss there. That'll be good fun. Uh, hi, I'm Ed McDonald. I'm the author of the Raven's Mark series and uh, more recently, Daughter of Red Winter, um, available in all good bookshops, UK and US. Um, Traitor of Red Winter will be out in, uh, I think it's October this year. Um, and the final book in the series uh, will be next year. I'm a historical uh, martial artist, um, uh, amongst other things. Um, uh, also, if you didn't see my D&D session yesterday, go and check it out. It's had some really good fun with some uh, other really great authors um, on there as well. Hello there. I am Scott Drakeford, author of Rise of the Mages, uh, just recently out from Tor Books. Uh, book two will be out sometime. Don't have a, a set date yet. <laughs> Y'all know how that goes. Um, but yeah, I'm, uh, I was at one time a mechanical engineer, uh, corporate product person and am currently a full-time writer and full-time house husband slash stay at home dad. Hey everyone, I'm Ben Galley, um, UK author, originally UK, now loitering in Canada. I'm the author of the Emanesca series, Scarlet Star Trilogy, Chasing Graves Trilogy, Skeleton Chronicles, and recently uh, the first book of the Bloodwood Saga, Demon's Reign. And yet when I'm not uh, chasing some words, I'm usually chasing bears with drones out here in Canada and uh, a terrible snowboarder. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Premi Mohammed. I am also loitering in Canada, although the loitering here seems to be kind of more permanent. I'm based in Edmonton, Alberta. Um, I write uh, novels, novellas, short stories. I, uh, like Rebecca, write uh, a lot of soft magic systems, I guess you call them, but also a lot of hard ones. And 
my uh, next book coming out is the uh, debut collection of my uh, short stories, which contains a wild and wacky variety of magic systems. So I'm excited to be here today. Well, fantastic. Thanks, everyone, for the introductions. And uh, wow, again, what a what a megawatt uh, star panel that we have assembled here. So, um, so we can delve into this this whole hard versus soft magic thing. Um, so, can can you all define what a hard and a soft magic system means to all of you? Um, because um, some some watchers may not may not quite grasp what what that means. So, what do we mean when we're talking about hard versus soft? Rebecca, you want to we'll probably try and go in order again? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, it's a bit it's a bit of an artificial distinction. Um, the sort of working definition as a sort of writing tool, hard magic systems would require, would follow a rigid set of rules, might require more explanation up front to understand. And as we have been established, we follow those rules for the magic. Um, and soft magic systems would often be more social magic systems, those with more flexible rules, or just focused um, and some more sort of social empathy or sort of soft skill set uh, a bit like the definition you'd have i think for hard and soft science fiction actually they're quite similar i'm going to be a tiny bit of a pain and throw it out there so everyone can see if they agree or disagree with me on this i think it's also a gendered distinction i think originally it was hard science like hard magic systems and science fiction was a guy thing so it had to have guy stuff <laughs> and everything that was considered more sort of womanly would then fall into the soft magic system category i don't think that's true anymore i think we're actually doing a lot of crossovers now, but I thought I'd throw it out there so see what everyone thinks on that one as well. Okay, um, so I think the, I would define it as, um, I actually think the definition comes from the perspective of point of view characters in a book, um, whereby the, if the characters believe there are firm and hard rules and act as though there are firm and hard rules, and uh, they have to have knowledge of what those rules are, then uh, it would fall into the hard system. Um, the soft system, typically your characters are not magic users themselves. Therefore, all of it is deeply bizarre and mysterious. Um, uh, so, for instance, you know, Gandalf, uh, all of the Lord of the Rings falls into soft. There are no rules for how any of it works. But we don't follow from Gandalf's point of view. And the reason for that being that if we're following a point of view character and we are in a uh, limited third person or first person, and the character does not understand how, how their own magic operates, then it's very difficult to follow that. But I will say, I think that they are actually just um, perspective distinctions because all hard magic systems break into soft to resolve the story. It's the change in the magic where we break the rules that actually um, always is the resolution. Um, I don't, I don't think there's any gendered issue about it. Um, I, I certainly haven't seen that um, uh, because I, I don't think male or female, I don't think you could write a, a because I think it comes from character perspectives, it's, uh, it doesn't matter who's written the story. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna guess that means I, Scott, yeah, I guess that means I'm up, huh? Uh, yeah, I think the, the only real thing I'd, I'd add is I, I, I really like that way of thinking about it, Ed. Um, and some of my favorite stories are, in fact, stories where the magic system becomes less soft right over time and the characters progress through some journey of of learning about the magic system and it becomes closer to a technology for them right pass yeah I, sorry i was trying to unmute then <laughs> <Bye. laughs> like, yeah, you're great <laughs> couldn't press the button yeah i'd agree i think it's it's interesting in terms of perspective because i think yeah even if it's a perspective uh, choice or a perspective definition, I think yeah, you can either uncover uh, the rules or uncover the lack of rules. So I think for me, yeah, it's it's law and rule based. It's I don't think it's necessarily tied to complexity. I wouldn't say there are soft magic systems are always you know less complex, um, and hard magic systems are more complex. I think it's yeah, it's the abundance of law explanation making it obvious to the reader 
um, how everything works, almost like, you know, not that we're writing technical manuals, and sometimes obviously that's a bad thing to do to, you know, drown someone in information. Um, but I think, yeah, for me, it's it comes down to uh, the fact that someone could dig into it as if it were, you know, uh, or it could be taken out of the book and put onto a wiki page, um, you know, to have all that information there. Whereas, you know, as Lord of the Rings, that was my, I had this written down, I had Lord of the Rings written as my first answer and you beat me to it. Um, but <laughs> that's, you know, oh, if, I think if, a prime, if any, prime example. If only we'd gone for one that was more obvious than Lord of the Rings. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Um, but yeah, I think it's, you know, with that, it's the, um, you know, it's it's, I forgot what I was saying now, but yeah, that's it. It's the abundance of law or the lack thereof of law and explanation that someone could dig into uh, and understand and, you know, essentially extrapolate and learn as if it was, you know, a piece of technology, like Scott said. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with a lot of that. Um, I do agree also with Rebecca, though, that whether or not uh, we think it's gendered historically it's been written gendered quite a bit and the example that i'm thinking of there is uh pratchett especially in equal rights where um esk a witch uh tries to become uh, a wizard and it's two very very different magic systems they tell you witchcraft is soft soft magic and mm -hmm. wizardry is hard magic uh wizardry you know has all the rules um, it has all the, you know, the spells. That's how they're able to build Hex, which is not a person. So it kind of takes it out of the realm of magic is something that you are to magic is something that you do. So, you know, it's very much the case in the countryside where, um, you know, you kind of are a witch or you have the ability to become a witch. Whereas for wizards, it's kind of more you can learn to be a wizard because it's very rules based. And so wizards think of themselves as hard magic and witches kind of think of themselves as soft magic and in the book that's how they interact and i think i've seen that sort of witchcraft soft women and wizardry hard men uh distinction in books like quite 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 a bit so i don't think it's just up to the perspective character i think it's also up to like the source of the magic and kind of again whether magic is something you are or something you practice yeah, that's that's some exceptional insights, and and I and I concur with all of you. And, and I I do sense I think it was Ben that was saying that you know I, I I do feel that with the um the soft magic yeah you feel that 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 lawlessness that it's undefined and 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 because when I think of magic I think of something that's really mysterious. There's that element of surprise, you know, their their powers that can't be easily like described or, or comprehended, and you don't know the limitations of it. That's how I think of of soft magic. It's got this. You know this 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 endless um, you know reach of scope and power and this potential for this immeasurable amount of 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 power being wielded right a very you know ambiguous and and something that can be uh, you don't know how transcend transcendental can be um, so yeah that's 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 how I think about uh, soft soft magic versus hard which is you know again more more like I almost think like science but no those are some fantastic. Fantastic points that that you've all raised. So, so uh, what do you think, folks? So, whether it be hard or soft magic, what are the qualities that make an excellent magic system? Um, so, what I really enjoy the most in magic systems is magic systems are creative. So, the person practicing them can be creative in the way they use them, whether they have hard rules or whether they they don't have hard rules from the get go. I find using them in interesting ways can be really fun. Um, so, for example, if you think of the Mistborn, that's a very sort of hard uh, magic system by Brandon Sanderson, and depending on the metal, you know, the, the rules are set out, you can do different things. But I love the idea that for the same metal, if it's small enough and you push on it, it will fly away from you, and then suddenly you've got guns in a medieval, like, in a medieval fantasy world. But if it's bigger than you, it will push you upwards, and then suddenly you can sort of do train rails for mages, and they push on the metal and fly. And that's the same rule, it's used in two really different manners. So any magic which allows both the author and the reader actually to think, oh, if I had that magic, this is how I'd use it in interesting sort of new ways. I think that's a good magic system, something the reader can then take away and sort of tinker with and play with. Uh, are we, are we going to keep doing the clock? I, mean, <laughs> I don't know. Okay, uh, <laughs> yeah, okay, let's, let's keep doing the clock. OK, um, so really good magic system. Um, it's, because I don't really believe in hard magic systems, <laughs> I don't really believe there are magic systems. Um, I believe because if you can break the rules, is it really a system? 
uh, what what kind of system is that at all? And if if all systems are soft magic systems, eventually when we need to solve, so you know when we get to book five, and it's like oh maybe it's not so interesting these restrictions. Um, however, I'm I'm being a, a pedant really. Um, good uh, good magic systems are one in terms of writing are the ones that the writer gives the reader just enough information early on to understand what are the limitations, what can't it do. Well, I think Brandon Sanderson has famously said this in a lecture somewhere. But uh, if I, I remember reading The Magic Faraway Tree, where um, I think a teacher was reading it to my, a class when I was a kid. And um, there's a wizard who traps them, uh, traps these children. They're in a fantasy land. There are no rules, absolutely no rules in this. And he traps them there. And then it was half term, so we had a week off school, so I couldn't find out what happened next. And I cried every night for a week, because while the children had formulated a plan to fly away on a carpet, I just thought, but he'll just wizard them back. Now, it turned out when we, when we uh, got back to school, he didn't have the power to wizard them back. But there are, because there are no rules established in this world, being a wizard was a completely meaningless term. Um, and my expectations as an uh, as a, an emotionally inept eight year old were not up to it. So, um, curse you, Enid Blyton, for that and all your other failings. <laughs> um, but a good magic system lays lays out to you without without telling you that it's doing so, without like you know the lesson where you have to. It's really hard if you write really hardcore magic systems, but you know what it can and can't do. And therefore, whether or not it can resolve story issues for the characters, um, for me, that means an author's done it really well. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass down this way. We should have a baton, huh? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, for me, uh, I don't, I don't feel like I'm qualified to say what a good or not good magic system is. But w when I enjoy it. I it, it it parallels our science and our our progression of understanding of science very closely, right? Um, and really, it's indistinguishable, uh, as Ed mentioned before, uh, from the perspective of any given character, uh, from uh, you know being their science or an extension of their physical science. Um, and the other, I guess the other point I would make in terms of a good magic system for me, I don't read for the magic system, right? And I, I actually kind of get annoyed when magic is a plot crutch or a, a huge focus. But where I think fantasy in particular excels is using magic systems to accelerate stories and serve a purpose in a story, right? Because nobody wants to read about somebody taking 40 years to come up with an invention. And so we have magic instead, right? Um, and, and I think we see that across a, a whole bunch of uh, different books. Maybe maybe not some of the, the more popular books. Um, but I think there are good examples uh, of systems where uh, it parallels science, but maybe just accelerates it a little bit. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I mean, for me, I love rules. <laughs> I'm a little, I'm a, yeah, I have like, you know, essentially a bit of OCD and I just, I love things to be ordered. I like things to be explained. Um, and I've never read the Harry Potter books, but I've read the Harry Potter films. And I don't want to bring up Harry Potter because we all know it's not yet necessarily, you know, the epic and dark fantasy that we essentially write. Um, but with that, I'm always like, well, how can they do this if this happens and how, but then there needs to be a rule and then they've just broken that rule. Um, as probably more understanding comes from the books, but I yeah, personally prefer a lot of kind of structure, not so much that it bogs down the story and affects the reading experience. Um, but I like to also have the element of, you know, levels and hierarchy. And even if it's, you know, soft or hard or somewhere hybrid in between, I like to know that there's, you know, a different, different, not definite, but rules that the character can progress through and have that character development through the magic system. Um, personally, I just, yeah, I, I love magic in, in all shapes and forms and sizes. Um, I prefer my magic systems to be quite visual, cinematic, because I think, you know, sometimes subtle magics, um, you know, like we talked about with Gandalf, um, can, you know, essentially leave me personally wanting a lot more. Uh, and I think, you know, it's something that also needs to have a cost to the user. 
as well you know magic while it's fun to be overpowered and to have an op character um you know just pulling a spell out of the bag at the last minute and then just you know essentially destroying everyone with a click of the finger again doesn't give me that struggle and that hierarchy that progression of the character and the struggle that essentially i want to see um behind magic so yeah for my magic systems which i do write i wouldn't say the hardest magic systems but i mean yeah a lot of my books have ours magic is in the back of them and <laughs> a lot of different you know appendices that explain the magic systems in more detail so i like you know anything to be explained achievable um and yeah not use last minute to escape a situation i think that comes back to brandison's laws of magic you know the understanding of the use of magic uh, is very very important for the for the reader they need to obviously uh again soft or hard but understand uh, the limitations of the magic to be able to not be disappointed when it's used uh, as you know in a plot or in a situation for the character Yeah, um, I really liked what what Ed said about like expecting the wizard to just wizard the way out of the problem. Because um, I think my favorite kind of magic systems are not ones where um, actually like magic solves all the plot problems, but actually like causes at least as many as it solves. And I think the ones I really think are done well are almost like characters in their own right. Like you have some that are just absolute chaos goblins and you have some that are very kind of like stick up their butt, you know, uh, very prim and proper and would never break a rule. And, you know, they kind of also have their own histories and abilities, and they may have an arc throughout the story. Uh, like, to me, that's that's the best kind of magic system is one that has background and depth, and, and it kind of um, changes as, as the story goes along. And like another character, um, causes and solves plot problems. So that's kind of at least what I was going for in my Beneath the Rising series, where there's a scientist attempting to understand magic as if it's uh, basically an elementary particle. Like we were using electricity before we understood electricity. And I think in this world too, people were using magic before they understood magic. And now she's like, yeah, well, you haven't let a particle physicist at this. So she thinks it's an understandable magic system. But what I like about magic systems is that there has to be parts of it you can't understand, just like how there's always going to be parts of a person you'll never understand, or parts of a character you'll never understand. What's that famous quote that all technology is magic? I'm going to get this wrong and completely misquote it. <laughs> What's that quote where all Any sufficiently, sufficiently advanced technology, advanced technology looks like magic? Is indistinguishable yeah, that's it. from magic. That's yeah. The one. yeah. Yeah. No, that's that. Those are, yeah, well, yeah, excellent points. Uh, again, Again, panel, and I and I and I, I I do want to pull on that thread a bit. Yes, that that magic um, a magic system, I think, in in some cases, can really provide some ideal levels of conflict for characters as they they're striving at something that they, they struggle to control, or understand, and and I I think this leads to some great moments of discovery and wonder for characters and 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 the readers that that really enhances the story and and heightens the the excitement and tension. And yes, I agree, it shouldn't be you know the main plot point, the magic, I, I, I prefer books to be, you know, uh, you know, more about the char characters and characterizations, but, but magic can certainly serve a purpose uh, in that, in that vein to, you know, really creates those great, those great moments in the book about with wonder and discovery. So yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, and just to jump on the next question, to sort of jump up on what you said, like magic can also function as a metaphor, can't it, in the story? It can be a metaphor for something else that's emotionally true, although it doesn't exist in our world, and then that, that's the purpose it serves in the story. No, that's an excellent point, Rebecca. Yeah, no, you're right. Um, so on that note, um, for, for each of you, what's your favorite magic system and why? That's too hard to, to pick just one, but <laughs> interesting magic systems I've read recently, I can I can talk about, but a favorite I don't think I can. One I read recently that I thought was really good was um, in the fifth season by N.K. Jemison, the origins and the use of the, um, basically earthquake magic for the people who haven't read it. <laughs> um, I think that's wonderful because it's really built into the world, what Bloom was saying about the backstory being linked to the magic. Um, so it's a world that's had quite a few apocalypses and I found myself reading and wondering, oh, did humans develop the ability to protect themselves from earthquakes because it kept happening? Or well, actually, is it because humans have the ability to promote earthquakes that they, you know, they keep getting apocalypses? Um, so magic systems like that are both, and there's such a big scale, because often magic systems 
try to be small scale so they don't mess up the world too much. And she goes the opposite direction. A mage messes up, gets a bit of a psychological crisis, the world is destroyed. You think, ooh, wh way of raising the stakes. <laughs> you know? So I thought that was a really interesting way. And she still made, you know, she still managed to get a story that works out of it. She don't, we don't just get a power creep and then we don't have a world anymore. And it, because that's one of the risks with sort of high powered magic systems. Um, so that's one I read recently that I really, really enjoyed. Uh, yeah, I'll let everyone else gush about their, their beloved books. Uh, so I'm going to go with um, uh, one of the softest of the soft uh, magic systems in, in the hardest of hardcore books. Um, Glenn Cook's Black Company, um, which is published around 1984, I think it was. Um, this is a series of books in which uh, your the main character is uh, frequently around magic, but um, never really has any uh, never has any ability to use it. And there's a fundamental distinction made in the book that uh, it's like you you know you are you are either a, a wizard or you're not a wizard, and there's no gray lines. And the distinction between being a wizard or not being a wizard is so enormously vast. Um, this isn't like you know. You can throw a firebolt. It's if you if you're a wizard, you can do massive amounts of world changing things, um, and there is there is no explanation. There is no uh, there is no reason for magic. There's no explanation of how it works, and it changes depending on what Glenn was writing at the time. Sometimes cutting off someone's fingers will stop them doing magic. Sometimes they don't seem to need to use anything at all. Sometimes uh, I think it's in the third book in the series. Um, there's, a, there's a, a wizard who is uh, trying to stop someone doing something, and this guy is a few miles away. And I think Cook just writes, uh, Bowman's unleashed the killing spell, but knew it was too late. And it's like, oh, the five-mile range killing spell. He doesn't even know where this guy is. He just does the killing spell. So that would have been handy in the last two books, wouldn't it? Yeah. Don't care. I honestly don't care. And... You know, some some wizards they have one power, which is whatever their name is. If they're called Stormcaller, they can call storms. Why? We don't know. I, uh, you know, what? It, for me, it keeps it really, really magical, um, and I love that. Um, that's not to say that I, I don't really enjoy books uh, where there's like very uh, stringent rules about how it works. But um, few few other books um, keep up that same level of mystery and. Uh, uh, a real essence of magic. <laughs> Man, I'm I'm almost tearing up from laughing. Um, <laughs> I I might have to introduce a a five mile killing spell. Um, yeah, I I mean there there certainly is a, a magical quality to to that kind of soft magic, right? And anything's possible, and that there's a lot to be said for that. I'm going to cheat a little bit and go with two, but I'll try to be quick about them so you don't feel too bad about me picking two. Uh, one example is a semi-hard example from uh, the Dresden Files. I, you know, most people know about that. And the reason I like that is is there's there's still somewhat of a soft quality to it, right? Anytime he needs a solution, he goes to Bob the Skull and, and says, hey, I need a solution. And uh, hey, there's conveniently a solution. Uh, but it, he has to work for it, right? Uh, being uh, Dresden himself or, or uh, the other characters involved, they, they have to put time and effort and th there's some cost, not just to using it and afterward, but to even being able to prepare themselves to, to enact that, right? A and it, in my opinion, you know, builds the suspense of that story and and serves a purpose for uh, both the plot and the characters. Um, on the softer side, and, and going back to one I've uh, read recently, like Rebecca mentioned, is my friend Richard Swan's uh, recent book, The Justice of Kings. Um, I really like, and, and uh, I guess there might be some spoilers here. I should probably be more careful with spoilers with recent books. Um, but basically, he he has a, a a main character with two primary uh, magic powers, and just says these are things he can do. And he he clearly shows a cost when those things are used, and they're they're, they're definitely not uh, in the realm of superpowers where they're really solving anything for him. Really, more tools to get further along the you know the plot progression. 
but there is no, you know, here's this spell, here's this thing. It's just this is how this is a thing he can do. And you know, you you touch this book or or maybe read a spell or something, and it just works. Where are the rules? <laughs> no, I think, yeah, I, I do like it. I, I think, yeah, it's apart from the I don't know, my, my mind going mental over those sorts of, um, you know, lack of rules and the just ability to have everything like a five mile killing spell. I do enjoy kind of the mystery of, the, of a lot of soft magic systems. And one of my favorite, I mean, I don't know also what you're worrying about too, because I've got three, four examples here. <laughs> um, I don't have to say them all. Um, but yeah, just Robin Hobbs, um, you know, all the magic in her world um, and her series is, is great for the softer side of magic, even though, you know, it has elements to be learned. Um, I just, I absolutely love that. I think it's my other example is completely different, but Allomancy, which Rebecca's already mentioned um, previously. And I think it's, it's, it's great because it does have those rules that can be changed, bent slightly. Um, and I just think, you know, the depth of that as well is, is fantastic. And it's definitely been an inspiration for me in the past. Um, but other one, the one that I find, I mean, there's a lot of unique magic systems out there, but one that really sticks in my mind is Garth Nix's Old Kingdom series and the fact that you draw the magic from death itself and the bells and the locations and the two different types of magic, one of which, of course, has that incredible cost to it as well. Um, you know, the dark, you know, uh, saying it, some of the words blisters the lips and makes the you know the mouth bleed and all sorts of stuff like that and i just I, it's always stuck in my head ever since i read that series so yeah those are my my top examples sorry just very quickly i was going to choose robin hobbs uh skilling and elding's books as an example of a really good hard magic system <laughs> <laughs> it's been years since i read it but i remember just learning you know about the um, you know, the way that kind of it, it comes naturally, you know, to fit. It's all kind of like comes out of nowhere. And then it's just like, well, we're going to go. But yeah, with the things of the, the wizard wood and the elderlings and all that sort of stuff, it does get harder throughout the series, doesn't it? Oh, man. Um, I think I'm going to have to possibly cheat too. But um, I think my favorite, and it just really like a system, but I think my favorite sort of uh, style, vibe, uh, aesthetic of magic is, um, you know, in the in the system, people, humans aren't supposed to have magic, maybe, but they have it bestowed upon them, uh, like from a god or a demon or something like that. They've just been given something immensely powerful. So the magic system is basically full chaos goblin because you've been given this divine ability and you're not divine. So um, the Raven Tower by Anne Lecky came to mind for me because the gods can all do magic. The small gods, the big gods can all do magic. But if their priests or associates or people that are in close proximity start to develop the ability, um, they can't control it. Things go wrong. And same with practically all the Clive Barker books. So you get powers from uh, demons or the devil himself or eldritch powers on the other side of the fold. And you, a human, kind of don't know how to control it. You know you've got these abilities. Um, you cause everything to go wrong. And I also like that often in that style of book, there's also sort of inherently magical artifacts. I'm a big fan of things just being inherently magical on their own, you know, kind of like in Lord of the Rings where the hobbits aren't magical except for their ordinary earth magic or whatever. But, you know, Sting still glows blue when you carry it, even though you're not a wizard or anything like that, even though you're not using magic. Um, you know, Sting is basically like Le Marchand's box, except less horribly terrible. <laughs> Because oh, I wish mine glowed blue, but <laughs> 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 oh, I just noticed that. Oh, how cool! Have, yeah, stick on the shelf. So there must not be any orcs nearby. No, thankfully, yeah, I killed them all. Um, I was going to say, if no one's using Chaos Goblin for a book title, can I steal that? Because <laughs> I really <laughs> like that phrase. <laughs> well, those are awesome, Rex. Too, it's great. You know, I'm sure people's TBRs are groaning now with some of those. I, I actually have to give a shout out. Uh, specifically, too, I'm going to cheat too, although technically, even as a moderator, I shouldn't. And there one, uh, Ben Gali, actually, uh, the written, I actually did really like the the vibe in the Emanesca and with the School of Arc Mages. And the, yeah, I thought that was a really cool vibe, more on the soft magic. And and for the hard magic, I got a good quick shout out to uh, Thomas Hard Riley, We Break Immortals. It's a chonker, but um, it's probably, I mean, short of someone like Sanderson, it's probably one of the most like, comprehensive detailed hard magic systems i've ever i've ever read like the achievements just 
gargantuan. There's this comprehensive appendix to explain the mag magic system. And, it, and, and you know, to be honest with you, the hard, hard magic stuff is really my preference, but I really enjoyed that that book. So, but yeah, definitely on the soft magic side, I really dug what Ben did uh, with with the written, which is which is uh, the the first book in MSK, and I and Thomas Hard Riley, I really liked his 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 hard magic. Uh, those two kind of stand out. So, I know I'm cheating, but that. <laughs> no, it's a treat. So, <laughs> okay, so. Um, do you find that there are any particular drawbacks to each type of magic system? Um, I guess it links back to what Ed was saying, and then quite a lot of people picked up on it, as to can it solve all your problems for you, the magic system? And if so, why wasn't it used before? And I think actually both magic systems suffer from that. So if you establish rules for a hard magic system, it's a bit like establishing the rules of a detective novel. The reader should have all the keys to find the solution. So if then you add a rule at the last minute, to find the solution that can be really unsatisfying for the reader. They were like, well, you've just changed the rules of the game. I could, I could not guess that. And then soft magic systems can suffer from the opposite because they haven't explained it. They can introduce new elements. But actually, readers only believe what you tell them. I don't know if you've noticed this. In the first third of the book, tell them anything after the first third of the book. They're like, no, that's not how your magic system works. You tell them, I, I invented it? No, you have to have told them in that first part and then they can apply it to the rest of the story. Um, so I think that's something to be careful of. And I think the most successful magic systems are ones where you get that aha moment. Like you had all the keys in hand, you still can't see the solution. And when the character finds the solution by twisting an existing rule in, this, like, in a smart way, you were using something that was there all along, but the reader hadn't seen it, that's when you get a really good moment because you think, oh, I should have thought of that. Of course, the magic has always worked this way. It can do this. I just hadn't thought of it this way. Um, so yeah, that, that's something I think and of course, as, as authors, it's difficult because once we've established the rules, then we have to think of interesting ways to use them. And we've put all our cool stuff in the first third because we were so proud of it. <laughs> so then it's up to us to find new ways of using it. So I guess, um, I mean, even being even more <laughs> annoying, um, I, I also don't see magic systems as being something that can be divisible from... Uh, a story, uh, and, and I, I think of characters as, as this as well. Of course, if you're talking about like um, what's the magic system in a role play game, yeah, yeah, you have it, but uh, that's that's why it's a game. Um, in, in the same way, I don't have a combat system in my books, uh, but you would in an RPG, um, and it all comes down to what sort of story are you telling. Um, if you want your characters to Typically, if you want your characters to have to resolve things through um, wits in some way, um, through their through their uh, or through their character strengths, that, then soft magic systems can work really well. T Kingfisher's uh, Nettle and Bone um, last year was really good for this. It's kind of like a modern fairy tale, um, but we don't need to know what the rules of the magic are. Not all of them, anyway. What, what in soft magic you need limitations. Um, there has to be a reason why you don't have, uh, you know, why why can't I just magic someone on the other side of the world dead when I want to? Why can't Sauron just, you know, why why can it, it gets frustrating if you, if you don't at least have reasonable expectations? But you know, a lot of soft magic systems, you just kind of assume because things haven't happened, they probably can't. Um, and that, that's the limitation in the soft magic system there, that uh, when it turns out, if you mind that five-mile killing spell, like if that bothers you when you get to that point in the book, that, that is an issue. Me, I love it. But with the hard magic system, um, you get the the completely... Well, first of all, it. I mean, who the hell am I to talk? Somewhere... At the back of this, <laughs> back of this book, I've actually got some like some like what is the magic system um, written out, um, but it's boring. Rule, I th I think rules and get having to learn how it all works is like incredibly dull. Even though I write a magic system about six trances that all do different things, and um, for me, for me as a reader, but it you get the frustration that. In order to resolve the plot, you can't just do what what the characters have learned through the whole book to do. They have to break the system, and then oh, it turns out 
we can break the system. And it wasn't, the rules weren't the rules. Um, and you run the risk of being a bit deus ex um, uh, with that. The best authors don't make those mistakes um, in either sense. Um, they don't make it boring. They don't make it... If if surprises are commonplace, then surprises aren't surprising as well, you know? Um, so it, it's all in how you write it, um, all the way through, um, whichever system. But, uh, yeah, they, they basically... Ri they, ri they run the risk of becoming each other. And if you really like the one you're reading, you don't want it to be the other one. If you're in the middle, you're probably happy either way. Yep. Don't have a ton to add to what you two just said. If it's too prescriptive, too detailed, it's boring as hell. And if everything's solved or, or you know, you're constantly revealing new magic abilities to solve problems, I just stop reading because it's there's no suspense. You just killed all suspense. Yeah, I think that's definitely the problem. I mean, I, I approach it as, you know, so many readers are, just as authors, uh, are so different in their tastes, you know, hard, soft, somewhere in between. Um, I think, yeah, some readers will get bogged down by the explanation um, if it especially isn't drawn out or in uh, kind of introduced in a way that lets people know there's more and then obviously slowly drip feed that information without it being too deus ex. Um, I think, yeah, a lot of people on the other side, though, will say, I, I need more rules. So it really comes down to reader tastes um, that's obviously championed by the author's taste above that. And obviously, you know, that's <laughs> getting into a different podcast about, <laughs> you know, how to find readers, et cetera. Um, but yeah, I think as an author approaching it from that, just, uh, that direction, I think um, taking my most recent um, my uh, Demon's Reign, my most recent book there, um, it is a progression fantasy that does have um, a magic system that is pretty you know, set in stone. But I've made the mistake with other books beforehand of just being like, oh, crap, I need to actually add something. This breaks. I don't want to break the rules, and I have to then somehow find a way around it in a clever and satisfying way. And so I've limited myself way too early on book one and by book three, it's becoming a pain. Just like introducing phoenixes uh, that I did in my first book of the of Emanesca, when they don't, they can't exist in the world later on. I was like, oh god, um, had to go back and make some changes. Um, I think also with a soft magic system, yeah, it comes as a as an author. Um, it does give you the scope to make a lot of changes later on, but again, you, you lose, as we said, the suspense, the surprise, um, and it again can be seen as a kind of a cop out and just something that's nice and easy. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's, it's, I don't know, it depends on the reader for me. Um, but again, I think it all definitely comes back to what the author wants and what the author likes. And again, if, you know, not every book is for everyone else. Yeah, definitely not a lot to add there, I, but I agree definitely with what Rebecca said, which is that the drawbacks of either type of magic system are the drawbacks that we all have to watch out for, like Hawks writing genre anyway, because genre is basically defined by being, you know, books that readers will come into with preconceived expectations. And for a fantasy book, one of the expectations is that we are going to set up the, the sort of story world and the, you can do this, you can't do this, you could probably twist this, but this isn't described yet in like the first third or so. So like, for instance, for me, where uh, with the Beneath the Rising series, where I wrote the first book as a standalone. It got picked up at a two book deal. And then the third book kind of came out of nowhere. Um, I had the devil's own time trying to be consistent with the magic world that I had set up in the first third of that book written like years ago to get to the end of the third book to be like, okay, um, is this still consistent with what we said would work in the first third of the first book and nothing new has been introduced and no one's going to come to my house to throw tomatoes at me because, oh, you changed all the rules. You broke this instead of twisted this. It, none of this should have been possible. You made it too easy. You cheated. The main thing that readers do not like is when authors cheat. So I think that's the drawback of, of either, either system. Yeah, those are great. Those are great points, uh, panel, and, and I and I do believe there are drawbacks, but you know, not necessarily things that you can't overcome. Um, you know, in that vein, um, you know, and I, I probably would have to divide this into perhaps and maybe not publish when we talk about publishing trends, self-publishing versus traditional publishing, because again, you know, a bit of a different different thing there when we're talking about uh, trends and what um, big five traditional houses are looking to publish versus what 
indie authors like myself are, are, are putting out there because we can pretty well put out uh, whatever we want and kind of almost create the trends, um, you know, I feel, but but perhaps I'm wrong. But in any case, what, what, do, you, what do you folks think um, about the publishing trend? Is it leaning towards hard or versus soft magic? And again, you may have to delineate between uh, indie versus uh, trad if you feel it necessary. Um, but but yeah, and I guess you know you have, I mean, Brandon Sanderson I think is kind of an outlier in some ways. And you know, I mean, I mean, I, I but but in, you know, thinking of him especially, you know, in in mind, um, what do you think the trends are like hard or soft magic? What are you seeing with what you're reading out there and, and seeing that's popular? I mean, I, I don't know. I've got very eclectic tastes, and I read things that were published ages ago. So I don't know if it's a trend. My instinct would be that historically we were probably more in hard magic systems, probably because at the birth of the genre, you have to be more clear on what you're doing, and then you can move towards softer magic systems. But I'm not sure that's entirely true because we just cited Tolkien, and as Ed said, maybe from Gandalf's POV, that's the heart. And if you go back far enough, of course, if you go back to myths and legends, uh, if you go back to Icelandic sagas, there's lots of magic that is technically soft magic systems. Um, that there's wonderful things in, in I, I'm a big Icelandic saga fan, I had a period where I read sort of everything. Uh, and there's stuff like, you know, there's a magical arrow uh, made out of stone, but you can only shoot it once and then it disappears. I was like, sorry? What, what, why, how? No, no explanation, this is it, it's a magical arrow, it goes. Or, you know, there's the, the wonderful scene where um, someone's dead and he comes back as a zombie. This is all, you know, authentic uh, Icelandic saga of before, you know, the, the first millennia. Uh, and so they go and fetch his wife and they're like, sorry, your husband died, but he resurrected. He's walking around a zombie, creeping everyone out. Can you tell him to stay dead? So she goes and sees him, says, can you please stay dead, honey? He says, yeah, but you know, I've just got a few things to sort out first, sort things out, goes back to being dead. Um, so I suppose it depends where, where do you start the trend? If you start far away enough, we were definitely in soft and we moved to hard magic systems. <laughs> if you started the 80s, 90s and the D&D influence, then we probably started with hard and moved on to soft. I guess hopefully authors now feel freer to do hybrid systems things um, like the um, Russian authors, the Strugatsi brothers in Monday starts on a Saturday. It's all fairy tale magic, but they're looking at it like scientists. You know, he finds this coin that reappears in his pocket all the time, this magical coin, the main character, and he thinks, oh, I wonder if it reappears in my pocket in all circumstances. You know, if I pay it to buy bread and to buy fish, does it reappear? If I keep my hands in my pockets, oh, it changes pocket. If I have mine in both pockets, where does it reappear? <laughs> you know, um, So things like that, hybrid systems are, I hope, something we're moving towards so we don't have to worry so much about the definition and we can have fun with the rules. Um, so uh, in terms of being a trend or, or how trends are acting, I don't think there are any trends um, in terms of them um, because I think there's there's been room for lots of different types of stories for a very long time. I think that um, when people are doing the hardest of the hard magic systems and sanderson's you know the great example we've got a cat invasion going on this was an, an un, unscheduled streamer has uh has appeared. sorry this, it's soft magic <laughs> it's cute <laughs> um yeah the the very hard most hardcore magic systems i think are much more recent um as well um very hard magic systems tend to be about characters learning magic um, that's why they have to feel like such hard systems. And that's a very particular type of book. Um, I mean, even even within that, there's room for soft. But publishers, uh, and I can only speak for traditional publishing here, I, I, uh, but in traditional publishing, publishing, all the editors I know buy books that they like um, uh, or that they feel are on trend. If you could prove that uh, there was a big... Um, a big trend for hard magic and only hard magic, they'd all be buying it, um, whether they liked it or not, <laughs> frankly. Um, but really what they want is to buy books that they really love. And I don't, I think there've been enough, uh, as we see, it's, it's, there's, a, there's a level of blurred lines regardless, but there've been enough successful soft or hard book magic books um, that publishers don't feel, in the way, in the way that in, uh, you know, in, between 2007 and 2018, Grimdark books were the thing. If, it, if an agent said, this is Grimdark, it tripled its chances of getting bought. Still had to be worth something, but, you know. Um, uh, and if we had, it's hard magic, then maybe that'd be the case. But um, that is not, I, I don't think that is anywhere close to top trend right now.
Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, sorry, I was just uh, fiddling with the mute button. Um, I, uh, <laughs> yeah, thank goodness I, I do think that the, the trend, if there is a trend, is a proliferation of a whole bunch of different systems, right? And and blends of, of different systems. And I think we're more able and, and it's more accepted in readership in general uh, to do whatever you want. As long as it's executed well, I think you can do whatever you want. And that's fantastic. You don't, it doesn't have to look like Lord of the Rings or, or uh, like the Wheel of Time or whatever anymore. Uh, you can you can get away with anything, and that's fantastic. I'd agree. I mean, that is the beauty of fantasy is that you can essentially write whatever you want um, and use magic to just get out of it if you don't want to go any further. But I think it's also yeah, it's like like Scott said, you can. There's so many different subgenres and sub you know uh, subsets of audiences that you know, and a lot of crossover between those audiences as well, especially now into like you know, uh, science fantasy as well. We're just blending complete whole genres together. Um, but I think, you know, it's in terms of so many magic systems out there in the fantasy world, I think we're seeing almost a, I, I think this kind of spans across trad and indie, but I think, you know, people are saying or feel that they have to explain their magic systems more to, ex to show that they are original or different. Um, and therefore you kind of get creeping into maybe the hybrid or harder magic systems. Um, in the indie world, I mean, we've seen a huge, an unbelievable staggering increase in game lit, lit RPG, progression fantasy, all sorts of stuff. And I think, you know, that inherently comes with a lot more rigidity and a harder magic system, you know, similar to, you know, Dungeons and Dragons RPGs. And, um, you know, those fandoms are, you know, voracious. And I think that, I'm not sure it, it's come from multiple different areas, um, but I think, you know, we've seen the success of it, you know, like Will White and Shirt Loon just dominating Amazon in all genres, not just fantasy. Whenever they launch a book, they're number one, you know, or at least top 100 of all Amazon. So I think, yeah, that has created a huge thirst for more of that, especially in web serials, indie published books. Um, small presses obviously have been producing a lot of that as well. So I think, yeah, from the indie world, that's my experience. Um, and I think even just as epic fantasy, you know, um, Sanderson being an outlier has also inspired a huge amount of people as well to create, uh, not necessarily harder, but to maybe think outside the box with their magic systems. I mean, I know, like I said, Alamancy was a, a big game changer for me because I was like, aha, I can do you know this, that, and whatever and have these rules. And that's why, yeah, Emanesca has become slightly harder over the years and Scarlet Star and um, Chasing Graves trilogies, they have the Ars Magica in the back and the back, in the back of the book and are very rigid. And that's definitely people like Brandon Sanderson inspiring me personally as an author. Yeah, I guess not much to add there. I definitely agree with Ed that the trend I feel like I'm seeing is that there is no trend, but also with Scott in that the trend seems to be a proliferation of instead of like you know, the old days, instead of people being like, oh, I'm writing a fantasy book, I can put magic into it. Now people write the fantasy, like the, the magic system before they start writing the book. And kind of like with what Ben said, I think another thing I'm seeing as someone who is, um, chronically disgustingly online is sort of the Redditification or TTRPGification of magic systems is people trying to put into their books um, ways to plug every possible loophole because otherwise some dork on Reddit is going to go on there and start a thread and be like, you know, it's, it's like all the sci-fi books. They're like, well, actually, I did the math and this planet would actually have a 28.5 day year and it wouldn't be 27 days like it says in the book you know so you have yes. people doing that for magic <laughs> systems <laughs> like, so i think there's possibly a, a trend towards that sort of i'm going to write this magic system as if it were a, a ttrpg and put in all the rules and hope that the seams don't show but i think especially as a as an author reading these i see all the scenes so i don't know if there's more of that, but um, it's something that I'm seeing more now than I used to. I think it's a trap though. I think the more you explain it and the more detailed they are, the more the readers go, oh, but can I pick it? I think, step it's away. It's a trap. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's a trap. Magic. <laughs> That's it. And, and it's so funny if you translate that to, um, you know, all of the adaptations and say what you want about them and say what you want about who's actually consuming this stuff and whether they're quote unquote serious fantasy readers or not, you know, Ring of Power, 
you know, House of the Dragon. The dragons fly. Why we don't know. You know, how, like it's it's that's. I mean, if you're talking about you know mass consumption and and entertainment and TV, that's that's what we're watching. We're watching these totally soft um, magic systems from writers who wrote, you know, um, either in the you know post in the World War Two era, post World War Two era, and up to including the nineties, where you know anything could happen, and we don't know why, and nobody seems to care, but we're eating it up. But that's, mind you, of course, that is on screen and not, not uh, we're not talking about the written form. But, but still, um, you know. But I just find that fascinating. That I just find that fascinating. So, um, now, do we this kind of leads into the one of my questions about um, about that specifically that soft magic systems are prevalent in media, TV, and movies. So, but but why is that? Why why are we content with with seeing this, you know, on screen where, you know, is it, is it a, a sense that we can't convey that properly? Uh, we can't convey those, those hard uh, elements on screen. Like what, what is it? That, why is it that we're seeing this, this, this difference between what we're, we're consuming uh, on screen versus what we're, what we're reading? Um, I'm not sure where the difference come from, comes from. I think what you were saying about what we consume, if you think of the Marvel series, I mean, you can argue it's not magic, but come on. Uh, it, and it's a really soft magic system in that they introduce new elements that they then don't use in other films that just solve the solution on this one, uh, that sometimes can do things that they then can't do again in other. So I suppose if you're telling a good enough story, especially on TV, then maybe people are a bit less fussed about how the magic actually works. Um, I think in writing anyway, it's a bit like combat will need to be more realistic than film because you haven't got the visual. So you think of a really nice choreography um, being filmed, it doesn't really matter if it's realistic, if it's good enough to watch. But if you write something and it's not realistic, people are like, well, yeah, but that's really heavy and how would you have jumped this? And Because you haven't got the visual and the visual can cheat. You can film something that looks credible and it's not actually doable, but it doesn't matter because it looks like it is. Whereas in writing, you've only got the words. So I think and, and then the, the reader will have to conjure up and imagine what's happening. But for that to work, you have to give them solid enough words, if that makes sense, solid enough sort of imagination bricks that they can build with it. So I think that's why writing finds itself have, having to justify its magic a bit more. Um, although that's not always the case. There's some very good magic systems that don't, you know, don't explain anything, just throw you in there. But then I think you get what I was talking about before, the sort of suspension of incredulity thing. It has to happen early enough that then readers are on board with it for the rest of the story. And if it's introduced too late, then they will nitpick again. Uh, it could also be a thing of how slow it is. Um, you can put a book down and think about it and come back to it the next day. You rarely read it in, you don't binge. I mean, some people binge read books. My sister reads a full trilogy in an evening, but most of us don't. <laughs> you read it over a course of a few weeks. So we have more time to think about it in between. So our brain has more time to nitpick. Um, so I, th I think that might also play into it. Uh, I've been trying to think of some sort of clever answer, preferably one where I sort of de deny that there's any such thing as a magic system. So, but um, I haven't been able to come up with one. Um, I, I think that we have, we do have hard magic systems on TV shows. Um, good example of this um, would be The Vampire Diaries, um, where you know what the rules are for vampires. Now, it's when they learn new rules which happens every series, that we start saying, well, how hard is this magic system? Because, you know, there's the vampires, and then the ultra vampire, and then the original vampires. But no, wait, the original, original vampire. And each one has its new rules introduced. Though. So originals can only be staked through the heart with one type of silver knife from a tree that doesn't exist. Okay, that's a hard and fast rule. Until... <laughs> <laughs> until the ultra vampires arrive. Um, and I think I think all the magic systems kind of work like this in some way. We've had we just had a, a slew though, as you're quite right, of TV shows that um were, are very soft in the magic system, um, uh like House of the Dragon, Lord of the Rings, um, and Willow, uh the best, the best fantasy TV show of the last year, in my opinion. Um ultra soft, even though we have two characters who learn magic. And we follow them learning magic through the series. How do they learn it? They just say the words and things of varying impact happen. 
I don't know. Um, maybe it's just that we we're just enjoying the, the pretty people on the telly. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it has to do with the medium, right? The the obvious of there's just in a book you have more space to explain and repeat, and people have to pay attention. You know, you, I I actually think um, audiobooks are are an inter interesting uh, middle ground there because I have found I can't listen to overly complex sci-fi or fantasy and keep up with a hard magic system, a a very different new world with a whole bunch of different uh, weird words and titles and, and whatever. And y yeah, part of that's probably that I'm just dumb. Um, but uh, I mean, there is an inherent uh, difficulty level I in different mediums, right? And when we're watching TV, especially nowadays, we're often on our phone or on our computer or have a kid bugging us for something, uh, something along those lines. Uh, uh, and, and it's just harder to keep track of, okay, what do these 17 shards of whatever do? And why is it important? And why eight hours later is this thing solving this problem? You know, uh, it, it, it's just a lot harder, in my opinion, to pull off a complicated and hard uh, because in again in my opinion hard magic systems are often more complicated uh, especially a sanderson-esque uh, hard magic system harder to pull that off in in a visual fast format versus a relatively information dense textual format i'd completely agree yeah, i think it's the general audience for uh that kind of tv and those kind of tv shows especially yeah, things like um uh, yeah, Charm, Stranger Things, Willow. Um, I think it is, they have to write it for a slightly more general audience. And if they go in full complicated magic system, it's going to uh, potentially piss off, you know, a big chunk of their potential audience. I also think, unless it's coming from source material, such as Lord of the Rings or Game of Thrones, which is obviously already written and are obviously very, very soft magic, um, I think it's just the fact that they have to write each series. You know, you've got a team of writers who might get, they do the pilot and they get greenlit for one series. And then they think, get to the end of that, and they don't know how it's gone. It goes well, and they're like, we need to write another series. Oh, God. And it's that kind of book one, two, three you know, problem that a lot of authors, you know, myself included, have had. And I think, yeah, it's that to me is kind of possibly one of the reasons. Yeah, I absolutely agree with everything. I think the main thing is kind of like Scott said, it's that you can't have like, um, the the reasoning you can't have the interiority uh, on TV in that sort of visual shortcut medium that you can in a book. In a book, um, in a hard magic system, the wizard can spend if he wants five paragraphs explaining why this spell works. Um, in TV, if he tries to explain it for five paragraphs, people will turn off the show. It's it's clunky, clumsy writing. Like writing for visual media is so totally different from writing novels. Um, and I think also partly, again, it's the shortcut thing. I think a lot of the harder magic systems would literally just take too long to represent. Like the one I'm thinking of actually is a uh, full metal alchemist, you know, where everything works with like the magic circles. You can generate one quite fast if you know what you're doing. But in that first episode, that chalk circle probably would have taken them 45 minutes to do. So you have to show it already on the screen and then by the time they actually get to the academy, people have shortcuts like putting it on their gloves and then just snapping their fingers. So the soft ones are just quicker and easier to represent um, than trying to make your audience believe that this spell can be cast uh, immediately in the heat of combat without somebody getting down on the floor with a piece of chalk. Like soft is, is less explanation, so it's inherently sort of um, easier on the reader viewer yeah. yeah absolutely and i guess with that uh, are we saying that based on the comments gathering from from that last question um does the age of the intended reader have a major impact on whether or not the the magic is or is hard or soft i.e middle grade you know kind of soft YA soft adult hard or soft like is there is there a, a difference between um you know the the, the reader, who's reading the book in terms of their their age and ability to comprehend that that sort of stuff. I mean, 
it, it's an interesting one that we don't write more hard magic systems for kids because actually kids love hard magic systems. They adore it. They adore rule sets and, you know, books of recipes. And I remember reading, you know, books about dragons and I was very serious about dragons at eight. And, you know, a wyvern was not a dragon. And depending on where they came from, they had different powers and some could fly without wings and some needed wings to fly. And I did a whole, <laughs> my um, literature teacher made the mistake of saying we could do a sort of presentation to the class. And I explained every single type of dragon. <laughs> But, you know, I was very serious. I took questions at the end and I made sure people didn't confuse the different kinds of dragons. For me, this was... Uh, so, actually, I, would, I think I would have read a hard magic system quite happily. Um, but I think often, sort of, sort of, especially young children's literature, lean into sort of fairy tale magic. You think James and Giant Peach and things like that. But there is a magical element, and then you sort of, but then it goes a bit wacky and whimsical. The peach is enormous, we're not too sure why. I mean, we get we get that the tree got the bugs, but then why isn't the tree huge? It it doesn't, you know, you know what? It doesn't matter. Just go on with the story, sort of thing. Um, but I suspect we could write more hard magic systems for kids, and they they'd love it. Give them give them the full like recipe book at the end, and they'll they'll try doing it in the kitchen, um, thus <laughs> emptying the parents' drawers with all the food and <laughs> weird ingredients. Um, but I'd agree with you that there is a trend that way. I wonder if it's not just the adults imposing that more than more than what people would like to read. Uh, I, I think kids get the hardest of magic systems. Um, uh, Pokemon, for instance. Um, you know exactly where you stand with Pokemon. It's magic. There's no reason for them to evolve. Nothing happens. They just decide to, like, uh, well, you know, it's video game logic, isn't it? But but you can also use a Thunderstone. Like, um, and none of the animals make sense. Like, they can fly some of them or do psychic powers. Like, but you know, you know, it's super hard. And kids love rules. Kids, they don't even need stories, little ones. They they're happy if you just read facts out of an encyclopedia because everything's new to them. So um there are also, but then yeah, sure, we also have like fairy tales for kids. So um no, I have my my short answer, my shortest answer of the panel is gonna be no, I don't think it does matter. <sighs> What kids are you reading the encyclopedia to? <laughs> Unless you, uh, if you ask a kid, can you name a dinosaur for every letter of the alphabet? They will just yeah. do it. Yes, <laughs> that's true. That, that's true. That's true. But that's dinosaurs, and uh, uh, that's a little different. But yeah, um, dinosaurs are just dragons. They're just a different <laughs> kind of dragon. <laughs> dragons. Very true. No, that that is funny because I mean, so I have a, a daughter uh, who's almost eight, and and I see a lot of that. Right? It's Pokemon, it's uh, Harry Potter, it's dinosaurs, it's Percy Jackson. She knows, it, well, she knows the Percy Jackson version of all the uh, Roman and Greek gods, and she knows a whole bunch of uh, Harry Potter spells, and she knows all this crap that I'm like, I I I couldn't tell you a single one of those things from my read throughs of, of, of any of these things. Um, so I do think, you know, there, there might be uh, like Rebecca said, there, there might be an adult tendency to, to try to get away with a lot of soft magic and just say, Oh, this is the way it is. Cause that's kind of how we are used to treating kids is, you know, telling them eh, this is how it is and just roll with it. Um, but I do think there's a lot of opportunity to to have fun with a logical, uh, hard magic system, uh, even going pretty young. Because, uh, you know, point taken, Ed, uh, they will name off every single kind of dinosaur uh, if given the chance. Uh, if I can just, just me mention in response to something there. Um, I don't know if you guys have all had the same experience of an editor putting in your margins. But hang on, about eight chapters ago, didn't you say that this didn't work exactly like this and you couldn't do that? And you're like, the rules have changed. <laughs> I, have, I have redesigned the rules. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I got, to be honest, nothing to add. I mean, it's, it's all been great points. I'd say, yeah, it's, um, I was doing a bit of research for this panel because I don't really necessarily read a lot of YA. Um, and I found some incredible examples of quite complex hard magic systems in things like the Rhythmatist. Um, there was tea making magic. There was 
uh, all sorts of different stuff. And I think in a lot of fairy tales, um, then yeah, that, that also happens as well. I think it, again, depends on the reader, but I think, yes, also we get a lot of rules when we grow up um, and then we find out ways to break them. <laughs> That's where maybe sometimes we then develop a taste for soft, softer magic, I'd say. Yeah, oh my God. Yeah, going with what Ed said, kids love rules. Kids love rules, categories, boxes. Um, if you, like, especially if you read things like a lot of manga or watch a lot of anime, you'll see these extremely complex systems and the kids will just glance at like the wall of symbols and be like, I know what spell she's gonna cast. I'm like, she's a magical fairy. How could you possibly know that? You know, and they'll just recognize all the symbols. And, you know, even in video games and stuff, they like to know that the rules are the rules. They like to know what they can do within the bounds of the rules. If they jump and they end up embedded in a wall, they're going to be as ticked off as the rest of us. And then you look at YA books, like, um, I can't even think of an example off the top of my head, but, you know, they divide you into houses and they divide you into classes and they divide you into categories. And a girl from category three can't date a guy from category two or, you know, whatever. Kids like boxes around things. And the other example I was thinking of uh, actually was yesterday, the Diane Duane series, uh, Young Wizards, the Young Wizards series. Um, when that starts, the characters are 11 and 12, and uh, they discover, you know, a way to do magic after you take the wizard's oath. And in like the second book, they're using an Apple 2E and basically like a command prompt to just type out spells, because all you have to do in this universe is to write the spell out and have it work. And it's, you know, as it goes on, it's a very hard magic system. And growing up, I loved those books. I loved how hard the magic was. And I loved that there were rules and bounds around things. So definitely kids read both types in my experience, love both types in my experience. Very, very well said. Wow, it's amazing. Um, as we're getting slowly start to wind down um, in this, this wonderful uh, panel, I just want to, and I know for a lot of you, you've written uh, different books, uh, some of you different genres, and you might write some books that have more of a hard magic system, uh, some more of a hybrid, some more of a soft. Can we just get a little bit more about in general without giving away obviously too many spoilers, what readers can expect from you know, depending how how many books you've written and what types of books you've written, what we can expect from from you as authors in terms of the the hard versus soft magic systems in your books. Um, so I didn't plan on this, but looking back at the the two books that I've written that are published and their magic systems, I realised I tend to write magic systems I suspect I'd be good at. So I think I'm biased towards <laughs> authors and creative and magic systems. Uh, in my latest one, in The Collar Bound, the magic is a mental mind magic, the main magic. There's, um, I'm having fun with the counterbalance, the magic that cancels out the mind magic, and it's all linked to the flesh and the body. But to focus on what the main characters do the most, the mind magic, it's basically, it, yes, it's you sort of project insecurities, things that you've imagined the other person will feel upset about at them and see if it works. Um, and that's basically just by talking at them and gathering a bit of clues or just having sort of vivid imagination, you can sort of project things at them. And I realized after I'd sort of written the first one and I was working on the second one, this, this is just being a writer. You invent a story that you think is compelling, you throw it at the other person, you hope it works. And I thought, hmm, I'm a bit, I'm a bit biased towards writers in my, in my magic systems. And same for the young adult book I wrote, the magic system this time is visible. You sort of create threads of light from your fingers and you can sort of shape creatures. But again, that's very much a creative thing. You think of magical creatures you can create and how they'll fight other magical creatures, and then you just make them out of your fingers. And that, again, is just the creative process. So I don't, I'm not sure that's what I'll always do, but that's what I've been writing so far. Uh, so uh, the books I write, they, I think they feel like hard magic systems. Um, the reader finds out how stuff works. Um, in Raven's Mark books, there's... Um, uh, light gets spun into batteries, um, and there are whole mills full of very poorly, low talented magic users, and their only job is to spin moonlight um, and fill batteries, which is then used as electricity by the rest of the world. Um, where it's effectively, it's it's pretty, it's a pretty bad deal if you're an untalented magic user. Um, uh, but in the same breath, in the book, the uh, series. The deep kings are the enemies, and all you know about them, even by the end of the series, is that they're vastly powerful, godlike beings 
They may want to be geometric shapes. Um, they are they are evil in a way that humanity can't understand, and they want to enslave the world. Um, and periodically, they do things of vast magical significance, and there's absolutely no explanation of how that works for those guys. So it's a sort of two tier system. Maybe this is a hybrid system. Um, for 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 the low down mortals, magic is almost um, mechanical in function. Um, but for for the for the demigods, um, it's weird and mysterious. Uh, for my Red Winter books, I'm going to try and show this symbol. You can see this this uh, circles behind here, uh, which it looks like a spirograph. Um, it's uh, the there is a whole system. The six uh, or seven spheres of existence. Um, they are trances. There is an order in which the trances must be attained, unless you. You are in the category of people who don't obtain them in that way, but then I've also left it very much open for all the rest of the, for all the other magic systems in the world that I haven't actually designed yet as I'm going through it. So I'm vaguely aware that in different countries they are not uh, Trauen, they are artists, or they are the Knights of Tharadatam. And I stick those in the book. I don't know what they are. Um, I'll figure it out at some point, but. Um, I always like to find out what they are when I get to them in the story. So, um, yeah, I, I feel like my writing reads like hard magic, but there's definitely some soft elements. <laughs> I like that a lot. That's funny. Um, I I only have the one book slash series right now, and the uh, catalyst, at least for the magic system, was fairly simple. I really, well, it wasn't so simple, but I can simplify it. It really comes down to uh, the thought of what if humans uh, evolved to be able to metabolize electro, uh, electromagnetic energy in the same way they do, or I guess we do. I, I am human, uh, as far as you know, um, as, as the same way we do chemical energy, right? Um, and so I, I had to take a few liberties to make this kind of work in a uh, pre-industrial world or early industrial world. But the extension of that is that my, you know, my magic system uh, comes with a heavy side of tech because electromechanical uh, evolves and, and, and develops in the tech world uh, as quick or, or more quickly than um, you know, chemical technology, which in our world at least uh, tended to have been a lot earlier than electromagnetic uh, and electromechanical. Um, so yeah, that's that's what you'll you'll find from me. I, I tried to keep it uh, solidly hybrid, right? Pretty contained within a a set of rules that were introduced fairly early on. Um, but with plenty of opportunity for badassery. Badassery, I like it. <laughs> um, I'll try and keep this brief. Um, so Emineska was kind of uh, probably initially my softer kind of magic system. Uh, the magic is essentially like dark matter. It exists as a song that was first sung by Avernia, the goddess of magic thousands and thousands of years ago it's always thousands of years ago um so you know magic is basically uh, it can be there's 15 different schools of magic but it's you know elemental fire quake um you know light uh, shadow all sorts of stuff getting into almost telepathic also there's lots of different types of magic um if you have sort of uh you know not all humans can manage the magic in Emanesca, uh, there are different bloodlines that can you know actually uh, survive the flow of magic going through their body and so, um, you know, traditionally, siren wizards will, you know, write and uh, write down scrolls and read from scroll scrolls. Uh, even in battle, they're just covered in scrolls that they'll pull out and read different bits of. Um, mages in the same world will just kind of speak it or mumble it under their breath. And then there are written mages, which have the a whole spell book tattooed into their backs, which um, puts the magic directly into their blood and makes it intrinsic. Um, only half the people who um, are written candidates survive the, the three-day ritual that that takes. Um, so then you have this very OP character, uh, Farden, who's the written, essentially. Um, and he's just, he's got more runes in his 
uh, spoiler, more runes in his uh, book, as it's called, very original, um, uh, than most other people. <clears throat> and he's also from a very strong bloodline. So he's, uh, yeah, kind of hardcore chaos goblin. That's his new name. <laughs> um, then, yeah, my second series, uh, Blood Rush, the Scarlet Star Trilogy, is named after the Scarlet Star, which is that side, um, a six-pointed star that is basically all about um, different bloods, and you essentially drink blood. And if you're able to withstand the magic um, of certain different animals, all sorts of different animals in this Ars Magica, that, you know, certain drinking like centipede blood, or, or Ica can you know put armor on your body and things like that so normally you can only blood rush one type of blood um but then there are people called leeches which can do multiple different types of blood uh, and then even different veins as well and then you have lampreys which i won't describe what that is because that is an absolute spoiler um but so i have a, a prospector in the what because it's a, a wild western uh, a wild west fantasy and so he's a prospector who drinks magpie blood so he can literally sniff out gold and then Chasing Graves was kind of built on the Egyptian mythology and the obsession with death in their culture, uh, or I should say the afterlife. And so in that, if someone dies, you can capture their soul by putting their body into what's called Nyx water, uh, which is this black river that runs underneath the world. Um, and then you can essentially capture them into a half coin. You put half the coin in the river, you keep half the coin. And so it's created this entire society that is the ownership of ghosts, it's essentially a slavery society. And the rules are whoever owns the most ghosts, hard to say, uh, rules. And so you could kill the emperor, claim all their ghosts, and then keep going. And it's created this horrible, horrible society where murder is basically a pastime. And so that had quite a lot of rules in it where copper is the only thing that can hurt a ghost. There's all sorts of different types of ghosts. You can be bound into things, inanimate objects. Uh, but yes, yeah, the magic of binding. And in the most recent one, Bloodwood, uh, yeah, Bloodwood Saga, Demon's Reign, it's very elemental, but it's based on taking a, a sap of a certain tree, which again, not everyone can be born with, and you are tested at five seasons of age, because <laughs> I don't use the word year in that book at all, randomly enough. And yeah, that's, it's quite elemental, um, except for fire, which no one has ever mastered, or have they? <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. Uh, yeah, I'm still hung up, sorry, on drinking uh, centipede icor. I just, I, I need a second. But um, yeah, I write uh, I write a lot of cosmic horror. So um, my magic system is basically something immensely more powerful than you has given you um, a mortal with a horrible, fragile, delicate human body and brain uh, the ability to do magic. So in the Beneath the Rising series, um, the eldritch ancient creatures, sort of like the Deep Kings that Ed McDonald mentioned, um, are uh you know they're ancient they're very powerful they don't think of what they're doing as magic and they don't think of themselves as magic they're just like well we're the biggest baddest most evilest powerfulest things in all the universes so um this is just how we are when that ability is given to a human then it looks like magic um so in the books that's actually given first to uh, a young scientist so she starts looking at it from a science point of view. So these are science fantasy horror books, which I guess explains why they weren't picked up by publishers right away. But um, science fantasy horror, and she, it's it's more a matter of um, discovering the rules for this hard magic system that humans have to use because they're not these ancient powerful beings that know how to use it intuitively or instinctively. So for her, it is discovering how to um, shape the magic circles, how to learn the words in the old language to activate spells. Um, discovering that the universe has to be shaped a certain way to do a certain job and a magic circle changes that shape. Um, so yeah, there are cases where she's, um, you know, on the floor drawing a circle in chalk. By the second book, she's wised up and has flashcards. <laughs> and also in the second book, she figures out, um, she starts thinking of magic as an elementary particle, like a, an electron or a neutron, and she actually builds a detector that works kind of like a muon detector to detect magic particles that are flowing into the universe, almost like muography, because I was temporarily obsessed with muography, I don't know. And um, uh, yeah, so that's sort of one system, but I also write other stuff and half the time I don't explain it at all. So there's magic, but there's not necessarily a system. Like in, and what can we offer you tonight, which won a Nebula and a World Fantasy Award for some reason, um, someone comes back from the dead uh, in a sci-fi book. Is this ever explained? It is not. It's magic. And I don't explain it because I don't want to explain it. 
And I have a book coming up from Tor.com called The Butcher of the Forest. And, um, you know, there's a magic forest. Well, how does the magic system work? It's it's a freaking it's a magic forest. It's got fairies in it. I don't know. There's magic apples. There's magic animals. Some of them can talk. It's just magic. So again, very much a case of trying to distinguish between is magic something you do? Is magic something you have? Or is magic something you are? So all three of those will come into play in that book. <laughs> wow, this is fascinating stuff. Of course, now I'm furiously adding all your books to my TBR. <laughs> it's going to be, well, it's just why these, that's why these panels are horrible for me because uh, it's just groaning. My TBR is groaning. So, but it, it, they all sound absolutely fabulous. Um, these very fascinating, intriguing magic systems that you creatives have, have, have put into your work. So amazing. Um, we're really winding down now with about five minutes left. Um, I just want to give, uh, first of all, I want to thank each and every one of you for coming on this panel. It's, I think it's a really insightful. I'm sure that everyone watching has got a lot out of it. And um, like me adding a lot of great books to the TBR and uh, also, uh, you know, thinking a bit more about uh, hard versus soft magic and, and what that means and what the implications are for um, when you're reading a book, uh, whether or not it has, which element uh, it has. Um, we just want to give everybody a chance to go around and just quickly uh, mention where their preferred social media uh, haunting, uh, where they haunt uh, their preferred social media platform, uh, a little bit about where we can buy your books, uh, your web author website, etc. So let's go back in order. Well, thank you for moderating uh, and for asking the questions and allowing us to have this great chat. Um, I'm not on social media. I'm afraid you can find me on my author website, which is just rebeccasahabi.com. And I do have a newsletter and post, uh, you know, writing articles, a lot like the discussions we've had today and things like that. So that's my only concession to social media. If you want to talk to me, <laughs> it's through the newsletter. Uh, otherwise, I don't. I'm afraid I get distracted and don't write books if I do social media. Uh, you can find me, uh, so um, edmcdonaldwriting.com. Um, I'm on Twitter at uh, Ed McDonald TFK. Um, uh, I'm on Instagram at Ed McDonald Author. Um, and uh, yeah, um, although I am planning, uh, I've been planning, I'm going to take uh, maybe six months off social media because I've got nothing to promote for the next six months. Um, and I have to write a book and I haven't started it yet. Uh, and it's going to be about 200,000 words long. So I really actually ought to get on with doing it. So, um, uh, but I am there. Yeah. You write one book and then they just make you keep doing it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I am on Twitter at the Drakeford and that is where to find me. Uh, I have a website that I very rarely update and I am kind of elsewhere, but mostly just on Twitter. Uh, and my, my book rise of the mages should be available just about anywhere. I haunt most social media and online platforms. I'm not usually loitering everywhere. So the easiest thing is linktree forward slash Bengali uh, or bengali.com. And then, yeah, my books, audiobooks, uh, special editions, and all sorts of things, hardcovers, um, books written on parchment, <laughs> whatever you like, however you read. Yeah, you can find me usually on all the good places. And also, thank you, PL. This has been awesome. And everyone else. <laughs> Yes, thank you, PL and everybody. Um, I am terminally online, um, but mostly on Twitter at Primisaurus, uh, same handle at Instagram. Um, I try to update my website. I'm really bad at it, uh, primimohammed.com. And uh, I guess last shout out for my story collection, uh, which is available for pre-order now and uh, is actually coming into the world in May from Undertow Publications. Oh, well, congratulations. Um... Uh, quickly, I'm uh, P.L. Stewart, and uh, for the books, it's www.plstewart.com. You can get them on Amazon, many publisher website, um, you know, wherever your books are, are can be gotten through the Ingram platform. Uh, typically, you find me on Twitter at plstewartwrite.com. I am on Instagram and Facebook, but really, I'm a Twitter Twitter junkie, so uh, that's where you find me. Uh, and as well, um, on uh, Page Chewing, which is a... Uh, Booktube feature. Uh, I'm the fake booktuber. My colleagues, uh, Taylor from Maybe Two the Pages and Steve from the wonderful Steve Talks Books, they're the real booktubers. I just kind of hang out with them and kind of, you know, hang on their coattails. Um, you know, we actually just got off, I actually just got off a, a 
an episode with the wonderful Rob Hayes that that may or may not be going on. And if they're still talking, that's that's a long time. But yeah, Rob, a great guy, obviously good friends with Ben. Um, and you can find me on page chewing. And also, before we go blog, led by the incredible Beth Tabler, who was supposed to be the moderator, which, um, you know, again, Beth, hope you're feeling better. Uh, that Beth is who I'm feeling in for. Um, Beth of uh, Before we Go Blog and um, Grimdark Mag. So once again, wonderful panelists. Thanks so much uh, for joining us. You're all fabulous authors and people. I can't wait to read some of the books that I haven't read from over you, which is a lot. So again, my TBR is groaning, and I'm sure a lot of other people uh, are complaining about that as well in a good way. There's, you can never have enough books. Like, come on, let's face facts. So, uh, But once again, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Again, shout out to Adrian Gibson. Thank you for putting this together. Uh, so I want to be part of uh, TBR Con 2023 and this Hard and Soft Magic Systems panel. And um, check out all the TBR, again, all the TBR.com, TBR Con panels. Um, the readings from authors, et cetera. It's a lot of great content there that you won't want to miss out on. So um, thanks for joining us and see you next time.